I get to talk about my favorite thing, coding and security. These stories and more in this week's episode of ThreatWire. Rabbit season has been open since the day the team at Rabbit released the R1 product. For those of you who haven't seen the R1 before, it's an AI-enabled handheld device that is meant to act as a daily assistant. Since its release, the device has come under extreme scrutiny. It's been reviewed by MKBHD, who called it barely reviewable, and the company investigated by CoffeeZilla, whose research revealed some allegedly shady practices and decisions. The code for the actual hardware was quickly reversed since its launch in early April and has been getting picked apart since. This past week, the Rabbitude team released a series of blog posts exposing their findings as well as the reactions from the original Rabbit team. Rabbitude is a team building a reverse engineering project and community to enable modding and hacking of the R1. In the blog post, the Rabbitude team revealed that they've had access to the R1 backend servers for months and found hard-coded API keys for services used to make the R1 function. These keys enabled them to get full privileges to see all previous text-to-speech messages, the ability to change replies, and potentially cause a major outage or outages of the R1 backend. We have internal confirmation that the Rabbit team is aware of this leaking of API keys and have chosen to ignore it. The API keys continue to be valid as of writing. We believe it is important for consumers to be aware of Rabbit's poor security practices as it can have devastating consequences for R1 users. We will not be publishing any more details out of respect for the users, not the company. Since publishing the first Rabbitude article just quoted on June 25th, the Rabbit team only mildly alluded to an alleged data breach, but in reality, this would be considered a security incident regarding insecure design by OWASP definitions. In response to the weak reply by the Rabbit team, the Rabbitude team revealed that they had access to other credentials, including their SendGrid accounts, and had sent only one email to Rabbit customers and users. The Rabbit team continued to brush off community security concerns, saying anyone could spoof an email. On June 25th, 2024, we were notified that a third party may have had access to working API keys for multiple SaaS providers used by Rabbit to provide services to our customers. Based on this notice, the Rabbit security team rotated the keys to those APIs, which caused a brief downtime on our devices. Our team is continuing our investigation. As of today, we have not found there to be any compromise of our critical systems or of the safety of customer data. Rabbit finally quietly published updates about the fact that R1 did have its source code accessed and that they were finally responding to the issue by rotating the keys. As a bonus, they announced that they were finally implementing automated code reviews to prevent committing secrets to production. Their final write-up did not allude to the fact that unauthorized emails were sent to their customer base. Instead, the CEO has asserted in public messaging platforms that these emails were spoofed. As a security-interested developer, you can imagine how I felt reading the responses given the product is highly publicized and has high visibility. It's 2024 and we need to remember to not publish secrets in production. In addition, playing the logic game here, Rabbit is denying any information was accessed, but says that the emails to customers were spoofed. How would that work? Either they have access to your email sending platform or the data of all the users was leaked and they used it to write emails and spoof the domains. A final remark was published by the team at Rabbitude with an entire write-up of how email spoofing works, including a detailed explanation of how to validate email senders given a detailed email signature. This was to emphasize that Rabbit isn't acting on what they say they're doing. The hackers had access to their SendGrid account and they aren't rotating the API keys like they said they would. In a one-on-one -on -one conversation exclusive to ThreatWire, the team at Rabbitude has confirmed that they've rotated the SendGrid account and 11 Labs keys at minimum, while other keys have yet to be completely confirmed as rotated. It appears that the Rabbit team will continue to be embroiled in security issues. If you're a user of the R1 system, the team at Rabbitude continues to recommend to unlink all accounts from your Rabbit Hole system, or at least any accounts with access to sensitive information. 
Hi, ThreatWire viewers. I know that we're in the middle of the stories, but for some reason, the lavalier mic just stopped working. So I'm going to use my Sure mic and hopefully by next week I can get this fixed. So thank you so much for being understanding of this mic error, but I want to make sure I get ThreatWire done today. So on to the next story. A major supply chain attack was uncovered by the team at Sansec that shook the JavaScript ecosystem to its core. Polyfill is a popular library used by major institutions and Fortune 100 companies to enable backwards compatibility of certain JavaScript functionality with older browsers. The Polyfill project was sold by its maintainers to Funnel, a Chinese-based entity, back in February. The sale included keeping the project open source as well as dealing with providing service for the polyfill.io domain, which was used as a CDN or content delivery network to load assets, scripts, style sheets, and more. Upon sale, the creator of Polyfill Project came out and said to remove the use of polyfill.io from projects. This was on February 25th, 2024. The sale was executed February 24th. Since the sale, the Polyfill Project has been inundated with new issues about the functionality, which led the project to be labeled as extremely unstable by users. And the Polyfill team blamed the new issues on being due to CDN migration. The team at Sansec published their findings about the new polyfill changes and found that the polyfill.io domain was found to be injecting malware onto mobile devices. The polyfill code is dynamically generated based on the HTTP headers, so multiple attack vectors are likely. Sansec decoded one particular malware, which redirects mobile users to a sports betting site using a fake Google Analytics domain. The code has specific protections against reverse engineering and only activates on specific mobile devices at specific hours. It also does not activate when it detects an admin user. It also delays execution when a web analytics service is found, presumably not to end up in the stats. CDN companies Fastly and Cloudflare have spun up their own endpoints for hosting Polyfill for those who are still using the library. If you're a user of OpenSSH, this story is very relevant to you. A new remote code execution vulnerability was found in OpenSSH that affects glibc-based Linux systems. The CVE, dubbed Russian or CVE 2024-6387, was assigned a high-severity CVSS score of 8.1. The CVE is viable even in the default configuration of SSHD for versions earlier than 4.4 P1 and any version between 8.5 P1 and 9.8 P1. The vulnerability stems from a race condition that happens during authentication. If a client does not authenticate within a login grace time seconds, 120 by default, or 600 in old SSH versions, then SSHD's SIG alarm handler is called asynchronously, but this handler calls various functions that are not async signal safe, for example, syslog. This race condition affects SSHD in its default configuration. The research also acknowledges that they are early, as they learned that a deadlock bug that is caused exactly at the point where they were finding the RCE vulnerability was reported. They decided that making the RCE known early was of highest priority. The team at Qualys discovered the vulnerability and published its findings on July 1st, so the day of writing this episode. We are still waiting to hear the fallout of this major vulnerability, but already within a few hours of publication, there is a proof of concept published on GitHub by user Acronel, which I've linked below. In their publication, Qualys estimates that over 14 million open SSH server instances are vulnerable and exposed to the internet. A patch has already been released by the OpenSSH team to handle this vulnerability. Please update and patch your instances as soon as possible. I love the discussions in last week's episode about Kaspersky. I did see one comment that had me thinking. I love the news updates, but miss the days you guys were showing us how things are done. I understand that this is probably about wanting more technical tutorials on the channel in general and not specifically in ThreatWire. But maybe we can do something where we walk through more specific stories and technical breakdowns of the vulnerabilities once a month or so on the Patreon in a live stream. What do people think? I would love to know down below. If you want to head over to the Patreon and support this ad-free show, it's at patreon.com threatwire. 
Thank you so much for watching ThreatWire for the week of July 1st, 2024. If you want to find me online, you can find me everywhere at Ending with Allie. Good luck, have fun, and don't get caught.